So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Hope you are all doing good. Uh, I'm Maryam Shreif, a senior petroleum engineering student at the Lebanese American University, and I'll be moderating today's session. So it's my pleasure on the behalf of Petro, SP Egypt, and Arab Oil and Gas Academy to welcome you all to the first session of our online course, Artificial Lift Technology, which will be mainly composed of eight webinars. This course will be presented by a notable distinguished speaker with an extensive experience in the oil and gas industry. I'm sure that his collaboration will benefit all participants. So if you want to widen your knowledge about the artificial lift methods, this is the time whereby I advise you to give your full attention to his informative sessions to benefit as much as you can. Without any further ado, our guest speaker for, to for today is Dr. Mohammed Gharib. Dr. Gharib holds a PhD in petroleum engineering with emphasis in artificial lift and production and operations. He is one of the petroleum staff at Future University in Egypt. Furthermore, Dr. Gharib is a technical and business professional with over 34 years of experience in the oil and gas business, operations, management, engineering, sales, and teaching. To highlight, he presided several positions at various international and service and operation companies, including being a vice president, director, and finally a general manager. Over the past years, he played also a major role in the practical training for the field staff and engineers in the oil and gas production engineering and well operations in different regions, for instance, in the MENA region, Far East, USA, and Canada. Moving to SPE, Dr. Dr. Gharib had been the president and program and membership chairperson at the Egyptian SPE Egypt section. He published and presented over 55 technical papers. Moreover, he chaired several technical sessions for local and international conferences and workshops. Finally, Dr. Gharib is the recipient of the 2011 and also 2020 SPE Region, Regional Technical Award in Production and Operations. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gharib. So doctor, we are happy to have you here with us today. And uh, on a final note before proceeding with the session, if you have any question related to the technical content of the presentation, please feel free to drop it down in the Q&A section. And of course, we will be more than happy to address as much question as possible. As possible. Now for the unanswered questions, we will sure take note of them and might address them in future Q&A sessions. Without delay, Dr. Gharib, the mic is yours. Thank you, Mariam. Thanks, Mariam, and uh, thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's my pleasure just to start. This is uh, one of the good topics, one, one of the very important topics about uh, artificial lift technology. Uh, it's, it will be, you uh, know, just eight lectures, you know. Eight lecture is not an easy even to cover the artificial lift, even one subject of artificial lift. But however, you know, I'll try to cover as much as possible, you know, just uh, to allow you to understand the system, uh, uh, how to design the system, uh, how to troubleshooting the system, how to select the best artificial lift for your walls, you know. As I mentioned before, artificial lift, it's for the life of your walls, you know. We drill the walls and we, 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 we are built the the process and, and, and all the investment in order to produce oil. And the uh, majority, or, or we can say over 92, 93% worldwide of the oil wells are artificially lifted. You know. Artificially lifted due to several reasons, you know. The artificially lifted because maybe the wells is depleted, drive is not able to produce uh, the wells, maybe you want to produce more productions and so on. My my presentation, you know, just uh, will go through some of the main top, uh, topics what we plan to cover during this is, uh, presentation. You know. First of all, the agenda and the content for the eight uh, lectures will be covered the following. You know. Introduction, we'll just we give some hints about the method of artificial lifts. And then we'll go to road lift system or reciprocating thicker roads electric submersible gas lift, progressive cavity, jet pump, plunger lift, and end, at the end, you know, selection of artificial lift system. This will be in the last lecture, last session, you know, after you understand all the basics, all the concern related with the artificial lift system and 
and subject and how to work, how to, how to design and how to select, even how to automate it, uh, all that uh, system and this value. Today, we'll start, you know, with, with second road pumping system. Why we'll start with second road pumping system? The road lift or second road pumping system, it's one of the main common artificial lift system. Uh, the, uh, and, and the second road lift system, just, you know, and, and during uh, this today and on also the next lectures, we'll try just uh, to cover some introduction about the system, what the system component, especially for surface downhaul, how to design the system in a very simple way, you know, and what type of software usually used to design the system, what we need to consider when we design the system, and then we cover some some few slides about analyzing the second road bomb well, how to analyze the wells, uh, how to know the well is, is, is performing wells or not, you know. And then we go to uh, second road bombing operation problem and solution, you know, what's the main operational problem, you know, like, uh, you know, just uh, gas, sand, corrosion uh, for deviated wells, what we need to consider for deviated wells, what we need to consider if I have a sand, uh, if I have a corrosion environment, I guess. However, all this problem, it's not only for road, you know, we'll cover all, for all the other type of artificial lift, you know. And uh, 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 at the end, you know, we'll try just to, uh, to see how to uh, identify and analyzing a road lift system failure. What type of failures, you know, how to identify this failure, you know, for surface and for downhole equipment. And then summary, you know, it will be the same for lift submersible after we finish road lift system, and this will be the agenda maybe adapted a little bit more based on your question and your requirements and so on. And then we'll go the same for uh, progressive cavity bombing system. We'll cover also equipment, design, uh, problem uh, facing the system, uh, and also the basic optimization, troubleshooting, and so on, you know. We'll cover also the gas lift and so on. Let me just start with introduction for artificial lift. We already covered this in, in one of our lectures before, but just give me about one or two, three slides about what artificial lift, why I need artificial lift, and what mean by artificial lift for, for oil and gas wells. Generally speaking, I presented this before, you know, but let me just remind you again, you know, about the, why I need artificial lift, how the well is produced, you know, Usually artificial lift is dealing with, with oil and gas wells and water wells and so on. But generally speaking, you know, in order to understand artificial lift, we need to understand the flow of the well, you know. Usually what makes fluid flow from one point to the other? What makes fluid flow from one point to the other is differential pressures. Usually the flow is flow to the low pressure sites. You know. And for that reason, the fluid flow from reservoir to the well pools from reservoir here to inside the well pool, if the reservoir pressure, P reservoir, is higher than the bottom hole flow pressures. But how the flow, it's flow to the surface. I said here, you know, a flow in order to flow from one point to the other, it's flow based on delta B. The pressure here should be higher than the pressures here. Then in order the flow to flow from the bottom to the surface, then the bottom hole flow pressure, PWF, must be higher than the hydrostatic head. This first, you know, the hydrostatic head of the fluid inside the well from reservoir, from the point here, up to the surface. Plus, the surface well head pressure, which is required to push or just to let the fluid flow from the well to inside the separators. Plus, the pressure loss inside the tubing from bottom to the top and this pressure loss. These three main items, three main component, you will need the bottom hole flowing pressure to overcome and order the well to be flowing. But generally speaking, we know the bottom hole flowing pressure is a function of production. If you remember the well in flow performance, when the production is increased, what will happen for the bottom hole flowing pressure? The bottom hole flowing pressure will decrease. That means if I want to, I want more production from the well, bottom hole flow pressure will be less, will be low, will going down. Then if one bottom hole flow pressure will be go down, if it's not higher than these three components, then the well will not produce. In this case, 
you will need to artificially lift it down. When, when this is bottom hole flow pressure will be less than the hydrostatic head or surface pressure and pressure loss. Sometimes you have this is pressure, if the pressure increase in surface pressure, if the pressure, pressure increased, if the flow line increased, if you have some problem in the flow line, or just if your fluid properties change initially at the initial life of the wells, I produce only oil, then the hydrostatic is a function of the depth and the fluid gradient. But if the water cut start to increase, what will happen for hydrostatic pressure, the head of the fluids? The head of the fluid will increase because the average specific gravity will be increased and, and so on. Okay. Then artificial lift, in this case, if, if you want just to define artificial lift and say what's the meaning of, of artificial lift, then artificial lift, it's refer to use of artificial, artificial mean. What, what mean? Artificial means any type of artificial just to create it, bottom hole flow pressures able to, in, to lift the flow to the surface with the required well head pressures. Then when this is required, it's just required to produce a well when it is not able to produce a desired production. What's mean if when it's not able to produce the desired production at the required well head? The well can be produced the desired production, but with not the required well head pressure. Can be lifted the flow to the surface, for example, with few BSI, 100 BSI, or just 50 BSI, 20 BSI. But in order just to move the flow to inside, to the separator where the separator can be far away from the well and so on. Maybe you need 200 psi, 300 psi. Then the well can produce the production, but was will was not was not adequate well head pressure. The well can be produced, but was low production was not a desired production was low production. As I said, as if for well and flow performance, you found the relationship between bottom hole flow pressure and production. It's just when bottom hole flow pressure, it's just increased production, decrease, and vice versa. For that reason, the oil can produce low production, but you know, with, with well head pressure cable to be flown. But if we wanted to increase the production, the bottom hole flow pressure will be not able to increase the oil flow. How can be achieved this is artificially lift? How can artificially lift the wells? You know, usually there is two main methods generally for to achieve this is artificial lift mean of, uh, of for the well. First, to use just a device like a mechanical, like a bumping, uh, whatever type, it's hydraulic, mechanics, electric, whatever. It's a device, like a bumping, <coughs> bumping system should be, uh, should be run inside the well. What this bumping section need to do for, for this well? How it's artificially lifted the well? We need from that this is defined in the bombing system, two things. First of all, we need to decrease the well head pressure. We need to decrease the pressure against the formation, the back pressure against the formation in order to produce my target production, the object production, <coughs> the desired production. But if I decrease the pressures, maybe the well not able to lift this flow to the surface. Then the artificial lift need at the same time after decreasing the pressures, below the pump, they need to increase the pressure again, what we call the discharge below the pump suction. They need to decrease the suction pressure against the formation. They need to increase the pressure again in, in the top of the pump, the discharge pressure. This in order just to lift the flow to the fluid in order to overcome the hydrostatic head, the pressure loss, and the well head pressure. This is the first mean or the first method we need just for artificial lift. The second, we can do together or just as a separate by injecting gas, by injecting gas inside the well. What, what happened with injecting gas? Why are injecting gas? We'll see this in details in the gas left. Injecting gas is in order to reduce my hydrostatic head because hydrostatic head is one of the parameters just, you know, creating back pressure for the well. This also will, will decrease the bottom hole flow pressure because when we're decreasing the, the hydrostatic head, the bottom hole flow pressure will decrease then allows the formation to be increased. Meantime, we'll decrease the weights, as I said, for the hydrostatic head to allow this more flow pressure able to lift the desired production to the surface. 
this graph just let you know just uh, to see how this graphically can be looks like. This oil and this is a fluid inside the oil, hydrostatic condition. The oil is not flowing. And if we are represent this by the dips, and this is the pressures. And if the static reservoir pressure is low and is not able to lift the flow to the surface, this is fluid, you know, and you have single phase fluid, then the, the fluid pressures will be not able to lift fluid up to the surface. They will lift fluid to up to a certain depth inside the formation I will be stopped. Because the pressure here is less than the hydrostatic heat plus the wallet pressure plus the, the pressure loss. But in this case, we need the well to be artificially lifted, to artificially lift in order. Just I need this curve to be lifted up and lifted up, up to lift the flow to the surface here. In order to do that, I need the pressure here to be higher. But these are reservoir pressures. It's not easy to increase the reservoir pressure here. Then I need an artificial lift system to take these pressures, you know, and just to increasing. In this case, the hydrostatic head not allow the well to flow because at that pressure, the well will be static and the flow will be zero. Then also I need to decrease this static bottom hole flow pressure in order to allow the formation to produce. This well is static. Then if I run the pump or whatever mean of artificial lift here, you know, for example, at any depth in the well, just below the, the static fluid or dynamic fluid level, what will happen? First of all, this is device, I run a device here, bump or whatever system, it will decrease the static bottom hole flowing pressures to flowing bottom hole pressure to up to a certain limit, pre-calculated, you know, based on your well and flow performance and reservoir characteristics and, and other things, you know. When I decreasing this bottom hole flowing pressure, the well start to be produced. But I decrease the pressure more than if, if I lift the well in this case, it produced. Even the well head pressure, the bottom half flow pressure will not be even able to lift the well. They lift the well to up to a lower distance than the static bottom half bottom flow pressure is less. But if I run the device at that dips, at the bump sitting dips, what we call inside the, the well, what will happen for this bump? The bump, they will take this pressure, what we call bump intake pressure. At that dips, I run the bump. Then the pressure feeding the bump at that dips is this pressure. After I decreasing here and this lifting up to this distance, there is a pressure decreased because the gradient of the fluid, you know, creating some back pressure. Then in this point will be bump and take pressure. The bump and take pressure is taking this pressure, low pressure and creating another delta B, increasing the pressures, more pressures up to a certain pressure, what we call this charge pressure. Pressure here able to lift this produced fluid to the surface with suitable well head pressure capable to produce to the fluid. This is just, you know, the shape of how the pumping system works. But if I run a gas or gas lift, how it works? The gas, it's, it will not increase the pressures, you know, this charge pressure. The gas will decrease the liquid, the gradient, will decreasing the, the gradient of the liquid. Then the, the pressure here is based on the hydrostatic head, the fluid gradients here will be low. Then this pressure will be able to lift the fluid with, with the required well head pressure. And, you know, just I injecting gas instead of I run the bomb and so on. Okay, we speak before that for artificial lift, there is two main categories of system, either mechanicals or just mechanical assist or bombing assist or to run device inside the oil plus gas injection or just using gas injection any sort of gas you know can be natural gas can be foam can be sometimes some people use air for shallow water wells and so on or just plunger lift as using the gas assist of the well and so on, plus the mechanical we try just to speak about most of this in the next coming lectures, you know, and, and so on. Today, we'll try just to talk about one type, it's road lift system. However, you know, since there is in the market different type of artificial lift and so on, for each type have a different type of application. For each type have a different capabilities. Each one have different capabilities based on what condition, based on the system, how it's running, based on the system, how it's creating the pressure, based on downhole bump configuration, 
based on the system configuration, the type of oil completion, the float component, and so on, you know. And when you start, the first point when you start to select artificial lift system, you need to know at what depth I need to run my artificial lift. If you start to compare this type of artificial lift, you found each type can be run up to, for example, for road lift, up to 16,000. Yes, there is a people run deeper than this, but it requires a special design. Can be run shallow? Yes, can be run shallower than this. 16,000, it can be the maximum recommended, you know. BCB 12,000, maximum recommended. Gas lift 18 and more. Plunger lift 19 and more can be reached. 2021, hydraulic lift, let's hydraulic piston, foster displacement, or jet bump, or PC, or, or electric submersible bump. Why is it have a limited in depth? We will see why we we'll start to talk about each system separate. We'll try to, to know why each system have a limitation in depth. Why I'm not able to run a road lift system, for example, for 20 feet or 25 feet. Why I need to run, why I'm not able to run PCB deeper than, than this and, and so on. And maximum production, how much I can produce as a maximum production for each, for each system. For example, if we, I have a field and this field, this characteristics was, was high producer walls, high volume walls, 10,000, 20,000, 15,000. Then in this case, you need just to jump to see, to look here, what the wells can give me higher production. Yes, hydraulic, jet bomb, and ESP, and could be gas left. Yes, then I start to eliminate the other. When I start to select artificial lift, eliminate the other. However, this table just gives you guidelines. When you start to select, when you start to want what type of artificial lift can work this or better for you, then you need just to go here. What is my concern in the field? I have in my field corrosion problem, corrosion environment. I have H2S, I have CO2. Then I must go here. What's the best artificial lift? It can be a hundred corrosive environment. It can be plunger lift, but plunger lift is limited for production. Then, okay, what's next? Yes, gas lift. A yeah, gas lift can be good and excellent. But my wells is limited for gas. There is no gas. Then I, I, I go like this, you know, until I reach to the best artificial lift, or one or two, and then I start to see a second criteria. Same for, same for solid. Gas is for solid. Uh, solid with gas. Can be solid with gas, can be solid with corrosions. What type of uh, fluid you have? ABI gravity. It's, it's heavy crude oil, ultra heavy crude oil, light crude oil, ultra light crude oils, you know, or what, what, what type of crude oil I have, then this artificial lift can tell you it's what's the better, what's the recommended. It can work in, in, in different, you know, for example, gas lift can work for ABI 1415, but the efficiency will be low, you know, and, and will not work as you expected and so on. What type of surface, you know, for artificial lift, Usually artificial lift run for the well and from time to time you have some problem, downhole failure or just you need to change the downhole uh, configuration because the well configuration or, or the well condition changed and so on. What type of service I need, I, 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 I need to do, I, I, I need to have to do this surface or to replace the equipment and the well. Because the surface is a function of the cost, operating cost. For example, if I have a well can be produced by, by, by plunger lift and also by, by road lift wells. And, but this wells, it's in remote area, you know. In remote areas, in, in case you have downhole failures, what I need to have for road lift system in order to repair the downhole. For road lift, I need either workover or cooling units. For plunger lift, you, maybe you don't need nothing. The weight catchers, it can help you, you don't need nothing. What if I have gas lift? The gas lift can be small wire line and we can use. Then you need also, after you selecting the artificial lift based on your parameters, your dips, uh, your fluid conditions, and so on, to see, okay, what's my, uh, next? What will be our, my operating cost? Which will affecting more on operating cost? For example, I found in, in, in my wells, the, the hydraulic jet bomb can be work and ESP can be work at the end for all these parameters. At the end, I need to compare. If for jet bombing system, if, I, if there is a failure, what I need to repair, how much cost will be for each repair and so on, what will be the failure frequency and so on for, for this one. 
This is just the, the, the guideline for you for each artificial lift type. Finally, you know, you need just also to compare system efficiency. If you look here, you know, you found different number for system efficiency and you will surprised someone who say artificial lift or gas lift, it's sorry, gas lift, it's, it's an excellent artificial lift, but system or just total system efficiency is low. System efficiency, that's mean total system efficiency. System efficiency here is mean power consumptions, how much power I lost for the system in order to produce a certain amount of volume and a certain amount of fluid from a certain depth and uh, at a certain bottom hole flow pressure, how much will be my hydraulics horsepower uh, I need for this liquid, for, to lift this liquid? And how much my horsepower I added as a surface to the system in order to produce it? If you divided this together, it tell you how much the total system efficiency, how much losses in the system from surface up to the pump, you know, just in order to produce this volume of pump. If you look here, we found PCB, it's the highest total system efficiency and followed by the road lift system and then the hydraulic, uh, or just maybe this list, you know, can be the electric submersible pump system and then hydraulic and gas lift came later after that. Okay, this is just introduction about uh, artificial lift and uh, what's mean of artificial lift, what I need of artificial lift. Let us start our with our first type of artificial lift, what is called reciprocating sucker road pumping system. Some people is named beam pumping system or road lift pumping system. But I try to put the name here reciprocating in order to differentiate between this type of artificial lift and the progressive cavity bump because both of them use road string. Before the people is called sucker road bumping system. This is a system used since more than what we call 100 years or, or, or more, you know. And uh, at that time, only you have this type of system using the road lift, the road string. But recently, you know, uh, the BCB use the same road string. Then in order to differentiate, we call this reciprocating sucker road bombing system. Why we start with the sucker road and the reciprocating road lift system? Why I start my lecture with this one, not with, with BCB, with plunger lift, with gas lift and so on. I started with this because Generally speaking, you know, out of this 90 plus percent of the uh, number of well, worldwide artificially lifted, over 72 percent, 74 percent are the number of wells using sucker road or reciprocating bombing system to produce this well or to lift this well. Then the reciprocating sucker road bombing system, it represents the highest number of artificially lifted wells worldwide. And the majority we can found in the United States and uh, in Russia and also in the Middle East. There is uh, a, a lot of companies, a lot of area using this type of artificial lift. What you call it is reciprocating or beam bombing system or saccharode. As I mentioned early in, during this presentation, we'll cover, you know, some introduction about the system, system component, surface downhole, system design analysis, how to analyze the system, What's the operation problem? How to solution? How to overcome gas, sand, corrosion, deviation? What type of failures? How it looks like the failure for each part on, on the system? Where is the failure? Where is the majority of the failure occurred? In the service equipment or downhole equipment? In the pump? In the roads? In, in, in what? In the tubing? In, in what else? You know. Uh, also analyzing the failure. How, you know, how to analyze this failure? And then some summary about all that and so on. Then we'll talk about today about the road lift system, reciprocating road lift system. It's one of the mechanical assisted artificial lift. It's, it's among this category of the artificial lifting system. Okay. What is a reciprocating road lift system? What is a road bombing system? And what does it mean? This figure in front of you is represent the reciprocating lift system from surface to the top. If you see that something at the surface while you are visiting, visiting the well, some bombing unit in this shape, that's you know this well is what we call sucker road bombing well or reciprocating bomb. Then the sucker road bombing system, just we can say SRP, it's sucker road bombing, is the most 
tubulars artificially left measured worldwide as a number of ones, huh? Because if we start to say uh, the volume compared to the volume, the ESP maybe came it's before the other one. But at the number of walls, the second road represents the highest number of walls worldwide. For that region, it's the most tubular type of artificial lift. Whatever you go, you will find this type of artificial lift. Usually, it's a system used surface equipment, surface bombing unit. This surface bombing unit is converting a, a, a mechanism, rotary mechanism of the prime mover. This prime mover have some rotation rotary mechanism. The bumping unit is converting this rotary mechanism to a reciprocating up and down motion in order to activate it, the down hole pump. Then the system, the down hole pumps is activated mechanically through a road string connecting to the pumping units, which is used. A prime movers can be electric motor, diesel engine, whatever. Something is provide a rotary motion to the bumping units, and these bumping units <coughs> convert the rotary motion to reciprocating up and down, up and down. This is this transferred to downhole bumps and activated the downhole bumps. Okay. What advantage of this system? I said that you know, majority of the wells as a number of wells worldwide. Some 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 articles say seventy five percent. <clears throat> Some articles say 72, 70. however, it's it's a plus or minus, you know, it's in this figure. When I can use uh, uh, road lift system, what type of wells I can use? Can I use for heavy crude oil? Yes. Can I use it for medium crude oil? Yes. Can I use for light crude oil? Yes. Heavy, there is a road lift system usually used for ABI 10 and 11 wells. Medium, medium in general, like 25, 30, 35. Light, yes, I know the people, I know some oil, a lot of oils, you know, uh, using a road lift system to produce ABI 48, ABI 50, ABI. For sure, you know, each type of liquid, it's required a certain configuration for the downhole pumps and the well completion. And sand, yes, it can use for the sand. If, if there is a sandy wells and so, yes, it can use. But also, you know, you need a certain requirement, certain downhole configuration for the bomb, for the well, com for the well completion. Gas, yes, also can use for high gas ratio. Currently, there is really a road lift system using for gas wells. If we are start to present, this is about 20 years ago or 25 years ago, no one can believe in a in, in road lift system can use for gas wells. If, if, you read, if you read the old book, all the old books said that road lift system it's not for gassy wells, for, for dead wells. But really just, if you look to the technology and the improvement in the technology, you will find it's changed a lot of artificial lift configuration capabilities, how to handle them. Road lift system as application can use for all application, but for sure, there is a certain precaution, certain limitation, certain extra cost you need just to configure the downhole condition or the surface even the surface bumping parameters. One of the best thing about the road lift system, it can be used whatever type or whatever pressures found in the well pores. What 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 would mean? It's wide range of fluids from near surface to bump sitting depths. For example, if you have a very low bottom hole flow pressure, bump and take pressure, the fluid level will be about few feet inside the well. The, 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 the pressure will not able to lift the well unless few feet, 20 feet, 100 feet, 50 feet inside the well. If I run this bomb just below this 100 feet or 20 feet, road lift system can, can lift it, well, can produce, can run it. Pumping, a road lift system can run with a pump intake pressures. It's around 2 PSI, 1.5 to 2 PSI. This, if, if you bottom hole from it, that's mean you can able to get as the maximum production from the well if you run the, the road lift system. But if you have a very high fluid level up to the surface, the units can be run and will be very easy for the unit and so on. Then one of the main advantage of this system, especially it's if for very low bottom hole flow pressure. For production, yes, it's can run to produce from one barrel per day. There is a lot of wells in, 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 in USA and some other area produce 
two barrels, three barrels, five barrels, ten barrels. And there is a lot of oils in Canada produce 6,000 6, barrels or just 5,000 barrels and few oils produce 7,000 barrels. But this is, you know, depend on a lot of things, you know. The system, as we'll see from the next slide about limitation, there is a limitation with the depth and production for each system. I cannot say I can produce 7,000 barrels per day with a road lift system from, for example, from 5,000 feet or 4,000 feet, no. The 7,000 feet from shallow wells, less than 1,000 feet uh, with a good bottom hole flow pressures, big casing size, and so on. What type of wells? As, as, as a well trajectories, I can use this beam, this artificial lift. It can use for vertical lift. All type of artificial lift can use for vertical lift, very easy. Can use for horizontal wells. Yes, a lot of wells now due to new technology and the road string. It's used in, to lift the horizontal walls, even in USA, in, in, in the Middle East, in, in Europe, and so on. It's used just to lift the horizontal wall. Slant wall, slant wall, that's the mean. The wall is have a deviation from the surface. It's just right lining slant like this from the surface, yes. It can be used as a special bumping units with a special geometry in order to run these walls in slant walls. Direction walls, yes. Whatever type of direction walls, and up to a certain dog leg severity, you can use this type. Can be used with a steam injections and, uh, and, and especially for hot uh, steam for, for heavy crude oil and so on. Yes, can be used for cyclic steam injection, SAGD, and so on. Then road lift system really can use for a variety type of oils, the right type of condition, fluid condition, and so on. But you need to design the right configuration in order just to lift this well. I cannot say, you know, that the road lift system can use for sandy wells and they run standard bump. No. If I say sandy wells, then there is a, a certain precaution in downhole bumps, even in the parameters, in running parameters. We'll see later on if I have a sand, what I need to consider when I design the bump and, and so on. You know, uh, advantage of this system, as I said, you know, is it have a high system efficiency. The percentage between the input power here and the output power here, it's really, it's, it's quite good, you know. The total system efficiency can be around 50, 55, it can be reached to 60 in some cases, you know. Then the, 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 the horsepower losses are not much. However, it's not the highest system efficiency compared to the other artificial lift. It's the second one after the progressive cavity. Since the system is a very easy, simple, and they have a lot of controls, optimization control is available for surface and downhole equipment. And it's very easy. What mean of optimization control available? That you can control surface equipment, how it's running in order to reduce the well based on bottom hole, change in bottom hole condition, based on change in, bottom, in fluid properties, and so on. One of the good things about this one is economical to repair and service. It's a very simple, and the field guys can repair and service the bombing unit without as required to the manufacturing or the service company. They can do all in the field, and even you know just the repair or just the, the repair maintenance is very very cheap. For example, if you have any failures in downhole pumps and you pull the downhole pump and you repair in the fields, the repair cost can be around a thousand dollar. $500 because the downhole equipment, downhole bumps is very cheap. And one of the best things in, in this artificial lift system is that the majority in the capital investment in the surface equipment. One of the things when you compare artificial lift, you know, you need to compare CAPEX and OBEX. CAPEX is the CAPEX uh, for, for, uh, uh, acid, uh, for, for the acid equipment, OBEX is the operating equipment. For the artificial lift, try to compare how much percentage of CAPEX I, I paid for the surface equipment, how much percentage of CAPEX I paid for the downhole equipment. For road lift system equipment, 75% of your CAPEX you're, you're paid for the surface equipment and 25% for downhole equipment. And we say 90, 95% or more for the failures of artificial lift system, usually it's having downhole then your surface equipment under your hand, under your eyes, easy to maintain, stop to see if there is a failure, you repair. You don't need the surface 
uh, rig, you know, you don't need the surface boring units to repair the surface equipment. But if you have any failure downhole, you need a surface rig and so on to repair. It's a positive displacement, strong throwdown. Positive displacement, that's mean, you know, in each stroke, they displaced a certain volume of, of, uh, of fluids, you know, a volume of fluid. They displace a volume of fluid and then run hole displays the same volume of fluid and it's not affect hydraulically, you know, as hydraulically, it's not affect by the back pressures, you know, not like the, 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 the ESP bombs, the centrifugal and so. This is a positive displacement. That's mean it's displace a volume and then displace another equal same volume after uh, volume after volume, you know. Strong drawdown, he can reduce the bottom hole flow pressure, as I said, up to few PSI. What happened, you know, for downhole equipment, if I starting was time, I start to see some corrosion equipment. Very easy just to upgrade the downhole equipment, the bump. The cost of downhole bumps is very low, you know, compared to the other thing. If, for example, if you run initial at initial uh, um, stage of the wells, with a certain metallurgy and with the time, you start to face some water cut increase, some CO2, H2S, then the, the equipment start to be corrosion easy to upgrade because you don't need to upgrade the surface equipment. You need to upgrade the downhole equipment. And the road downhole equipment is very, very just cheap equipment and so on. You know. Flexibility, yes, it's a very flexible type of artificial. Lift. What mean of flexibility? Flexibility is that mean you can adjust the system to produce whatever the formation capable to give to you. For example, if you are producing from depletion drive reservoir and you, you design the system to produce 1,000 barrels per day initially, and with the time, depletion drive reservoir and so on, the, the pressure is going down, and production is going down, and reached to 200 barrels per day. Do I need to change the system? No. There are a lot of parameters you can change in order to adapt this system to produce the 200. Initially, I designed to produce 500. Then with a certain parameters for bumping speed and, and stroke lengths, and downhole bump size and so on. But if production decreased, yes, I can, I can adapt to this change stroke lengths, stroke per minute, uh, a lot of things, a lot of parameters we can, we'll see later on how to do. And finally, high salvage value. High salvage value, that's mean, in case this well is depleted and just, uh, water flooded and you cannot produce. You can use the total, the whole system, and you can move to a certain, another type of wells and you can adapt it and you can produce. Then your, your value, what you paid for the system is still in your hand. Even if you start to resell as a scrap for the equipment, this one, you will, you will, you will not lose a lot of money for this. For each type of artificial lift, there is advantage, there is application, but for sure, also there is a limitation. What type of limitation here for the beam pumping is? Limitation that's not mean I cannot use this type for this one. Limitation that yes, it's not prefer if some other type of artificial lift can do better here. Or I need a certain type of configuration, special design to, to do for my surface or downhole equipment in order just, you know, to adapt it with this one. For example, I said before, you know, for application, I say the road lift system can be used for deviated well, for horizontal wells, and so on. But now here for limitation, I said crooked hole, you know, it's, it's a problem. Yes, limitation for crooked hole is a problem. It can be used, but the problem, what, pro what problem can be faced? Because since there is a limitation and this pumping system is going up and down and this road string running inside the well, there is, will be a tendency of friction, you know, between the coupling of the road and the tubing. There is a potential of road and tubing wear. But in that case, if I am running or just design my system to run deviated wells or horizontal well, then I need to consider how to reduce this is wear. What type of downhole configuration? From here, this is the design, special design, we'll see later on how to select the best for your well. Yes, there's a limitation for that. There's a potential of wear. What else, gas? Even for application, I see your road lift system can use for gas lift. But gas reduce volumetric efficiency for all type of bombing system, for all type of artificial lift. For that reason, if there is a gas, it can use for gas. But the bottom hole configuration, the design should be designed for this gas, should be carefully selected for this gas. We'll see that in the gas 
problem for road lift system. How? If I want to run my road lift system for gas wells, how I need to select or design the best downhole configuration? Can be used? Yes, can be used. But I need to consider, I say, yes, here there is a problem. Gas, I cannot use standard bump. I cannot use standard condition. Then I need a special configuration. How volume of gas? Is a gas, is a free gas as a bump intake, or only the gas will be free after the bump? If the gas will be free out of solution after the bump, there is no. But if there is a gas free as a bump intake, how volume of the gas? How much gas free as a bump intake? How, I, uh, uh, how, how can I compete with this gas depth? Remember I said the road lift system can be used to produce from one barrel up to 7,000 barrel. But 7,000 barrel, it's not from deep wells because the depth, there is a limitation with the depth. Road lift system can run to 16, 17,000 feet easy, no problem for that and, and, and even more. But there is some limitation with depth because when increasing the depth, the length of this road strength will increase. When I increase the length of this road strength, this is steel, or even if it's fiberglass, the weight of this road strength will increase. The capability of the road as a tensile strength and so to, to lift the road below it, it will be also have a certain capability, will be decreased and so on. Then with the dips, I cannot lift it more uh, roads or I cannot lift it more fluid because with the dips, the volume of the fluids and the volume of, uh, and the weight of the fluid, the weight of the road will be increased. For that reason, with the dips, I need to decrease the bump because the fluid load for the road lift system is a function of the bump size. If I decrease the bump size, for sure I will decrease the production because the production coming out of the road lift system is a function of the bump size. One of the bump size, once the bump size increased, the production increased. But once the bump size increased, then the load will be increased. Then I cannot produce high volume using road lift system from deep wells. I cannot use, you know, in the town and in the area, and you know, because it's a big, it's a, it's a big equipment as a surface, and there is a, a some concern about uh, environmental concern about leaking from stuffing box and so on, you know, even due to the weight of the bombing unit and the uh, size volume, for offshore will be very limited to use in offshore. There is a very few bombing units used for offshore, but smaller one and very limited, and so on, and so on. There's a potential of tubing wear. Yes, there is a potential of tubing wear if there is a friction, if there is not designed very well, even for vertical wells. If I not design the road lift system, oh, my road string and my, my, my tubing completion type in very good ways, in, in very right ways, then there's a potential for uh, tubing wear and so on. Okay, let me now just walk you through the component. Service system component. I will go step by step with you on with the surface component because if you understand the surface component, you will understand the system. You will understand how to select the system. You will understand how to select the right size of your equipment. You will understand how to compete this system. You will understand how to analyze your system. Then please try to understand very well the, the component of the system. And based on that will be very easy after that for you to know is a problem and, and to select the best type of, of equipment for your equipment. I will start with downhole equipment and the first part in downhole equipment, I will start with a well completion. Because you know, the worst completion, you are first point, you need just first point to design for artificial lift, what type of completion I need to run in my wells before the rig is moved. For the workover rig is moved or just rig is moved, what type of completion I need to run. In order to understand what type of completion we need to run, I need to understand what type of wells, what type of equipment I need to run <coughs> inside the well, what, what type of well I, I, I have and so on. Generally speaking, for the road lift system, there is a certain component you will find in most of your completion. You will find in tubing, you need tubing. Even if sometimes some people, you know, where very shallow wells can produce from the casing. In this case, we consider the casing the tubing, but the majority, let us to say 90 plus 95 percent plus of road lift system, it's using produce from the tubing. <clears throat> then the tubing, I need to select what type of tubing, what size of tubing, 
what grade of tubing I, I need to run, you know, inside this one. Second, sitting nibble. We'll see later on, you know, when I run my, my road lift system pump, the pump run in the well, inside the well. The pump needs to stop at a certain depth. Where is the step the pump at certain depth? It will stop in a device called sitting nibble. There is a certain type of sitting nibble, yes. Certain configuration of sitting nibble, yes. Depends on the type of the pump, configuration of the pump, what I need to run inside the, 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 the well, if, if the pump out of the well and so on. You know. Uh, <clears throat> what else I need to have? Also, you, you, you sometimes in some wells, you know, just uh, you need to have what you call tubing anchor catcher. I will explain in the next slide or just slide after the next slide about tubing anchor catcher, why I need tubing anchor catcher. For road lift system, it's a reciprocating bumping system. You need the tubing to be fixed with the casing. In order to the tubing to be fixed with the casing, we need a sort of equipment to fix the tubing with the casing and this equipment called tubing anchor catchers at the end the wheel head what type of wheel head i need just for this road lift system what what's the wheel head what type of flanchet i need to have here you know over at, in the top of the flanchet and you know, what type of wheel head i need here is this a normal flange it's a tubing hanger here how to hang this tubing you know is tubing hanger here or just there's a special hangers for the uh, road lift system and so on. Then these four main components usually you will find in majority of the road lift system. Let me just explain first of all the very simple well completion for road lift system. What is the simplest completion? Simplest completion that's mean completion you usually you run for shallow wells. What mean of shallow wells? Well spread with a depth less than some people is, you know at 2,000 feet or 1,500 feet. I prefer to say it's, you know, if it's 1,500 feet and shallow, maybe you don't need to run more, more tools, more equipment. You can use this type of completion. You need, you need to run the tubing, as I said, I need to have the tubing. And inside the tubing, you need to run the sitting nibble. And I said there is different configuration, different type of sitting nibble. Tubing, usual tubing in order to produce flow, through this tube. Sitting nipple, sitting nipple is used just to hold the bump in place in order to not allow the bump to move. Meanwhile, to isolate it, to seal the produced float from below the bump to the top of the bump. And, okay, and this is what you call sitting nipple. How the bump is run the sitting nipple? You run the bump in the road and sit in the sitting nipple in this case, you know, this for the insert bump. Then the sitting nipple is used to keep this bump in place while I'm going up and down with road string. Only the plunger inside the bump moving up and down and the outer bump of, uh, part of the bump is not moving. Meanwhile, this bump is sucked float from here, from this area and then displaced in the top. It's displacement, take volume, displace here. And this sitting nipple with the bump isolated the top, the float from the top of the bump uh, to the bottom of the bomb. Then the float cannot be circulated. Whatever I produce here is going to the tubing. Then produce a certain volume going to the tubing. The other volume goes to the tubing and this displaced uh, volume after volume until we reach to the surface. What problem for road lift system deep wells? When I start to run with a medium and deep depth wells, what type of problem? See these two types, these two, two figures, you know. The first one, this is a bump, this is a tubing, this is a casing, this is a fluid level, this is a road string. While I am going in the upstroke, going up, what will happen here, you know? The road, it's just to hold itself, you know. It's lifting its weight. Plus, this is what you call traveling valve is closed. There is a fluid over the traveling valve here. The road is lifted all that float. So always the road in the upstroke will be in tension like this. If, if the tubing is not fixed, what will happen for the tubing? The fluid here inside the tubing is lifted by the road. There will be no fluid just effect on the tubing. The tubing will be contracted. You know, what will happen for the downstroke? When you start to go downstroke, 
you will look here, you know, this traveling valve, it's open. And standing valve, it's closed. Standing valve is a part here of the tubing. Then all this fluid load is transferred to the tubing. Then the fluid load is, it will be acted on the tubing. Then the tubing will be stretched, you know. Then the tubing in each stroke will be contracted in the upstroke, stretched in the top stroke. If the tubing is moving like this, what will happen in this area, in this area and this area? This will be under tension, this will be under compressions or buckling effect. This will be a friction wear between rods and the tubing. If there is a friction wear between rod and the tubing, then the tubing can, this is a, the rod will be eroded like that, the coupling, and the tubing, this from the inside, will be eroded like that, and the tubing will be, have some failure, will be, have some crack like this. Not only that, the tubing is connecting to each other with a coupling. Each about 30, 31 joint of the tubing, there's a coupling, this outside. And the coupling even can be, have some friction if the coupling contacting the casing, will be a friction between the coupling and the casing. The coupling will be already done, the casing will be already. How to overcome this, how to use that and so on. Usually in order to do that, we run in the well what we call tubing anchor catcher. Remember the first well, the first simple well we said we run tubing with a setting limit. We added here for that tubing what we call tubing anchor catcher. Why I need to run tubing anchor catcher? Usually tubing anchor catcher, it's just hang it or fix it, the tubing with the case. Then if the, if the fluid here just change in the tubing, the tubing will not move. Then the first things for the, for the tubing anchor catcher, it's used just to catch tubing uh, to the casing and in order to prevent tubing movement with the bumping cycle and this eliminating tubing movement in order to reduce tubing wear and the road wear and so on. This will increase the bottom hole effective even stroke, you know, and result for a fixed plunger because when the tubing start to move up and down, I lost part of my down hole stroke because the tubing is absorbed that with it. When I, I lost part of my down hole stroke, then I lost part of my bumping efficiency of the bump. I lost part of my production. Then we run the bump like this and so on. There's a certain type of completion usually, you know, it's, it's not common, but it's used in a lot of areas. I saw, you know, some, some people say, okay, what happened if you look to the previous completion here, you know, you have this formation and the fluid come from some formation to the tube. But in some area, you have two formations, two types of formation like this, two formation. And these two formations, two base zones is, di is different, each different than the other. And it's not an easy to open the two formation to reduce commingle together. Either different in pressure, different in a lot of things, you know. There is bars, there is part department say, okay, I cannot produce these two zones together. I need to produce these two zones separate and, and, and so on. There is two types of completion in this case, what we call selective completion. I run completion to isolate the two zones. Meanwhile, it's allow me to produce the two zones. Either produce the two zones commingle with, without each zone effect on the other, or just to produce the two zones, just, you know, separate. If I want to produce one and test it, or just if I want to use isolated zone and produce the other one zone, I can use that. How this completion looks like, like here. Usually for this type of completion, this two zone, if the upper zone have low gas, you know, it's, it's low gas or ratio and, and there is no gas, sorry, for the lower zone is, is there is no gas and so on. Then you can use only one packer. One packer, this is, will isolate the lower zone or all the fluid of the lower zone and you run the bump here, will go inside the tubing and will just feed the bump from here. Meanwhile, we run in, uh, above the bucker or in the top of the bucker, a certain device called sliding side door or sliding sleeve. This is a type of completion equipment. This sliding sleeve have some board from outside, which it can be easy to connect tubing with casing. If I want to connect the tubing with casing, we open this port. If I want to isolate tubing from the casing, I close this port. Then if I want to produce only the lower zone, then we, you run with a slick line, wire line 
and you close this is top sliding sleeve door and only you produce from the lower zone. If I want to produce only the upper zone, then I run a certain plug, wire line plugs here in this uh, nibble, certain nibble, and you open sliding sleeve and you produce from this one. This type of completion with one packer I used if the bottom hole uh, of the bottom formation have low gas or ratio. But what if this formation have high gas or ratio? I need to have some gas venting from here, venting some gas and produce. In this case, we run two packers. Each packer, the first packer in the top of the bottom formation and the, the other packers in the, uh, uh, in the top of the top formation. In this case, also I run with two sliding sleeves. The lower sliding sleeve is used just to isolate it or to open the lower zone. The top sliding sleeve always keep open in order to allow this formation, just uh, allow the gas to vent in this formation. And this will be below the sitting nibble of the bottom. This is what we call selective well completion. Okay, let me move for the other part, the main important part, the downhole. After we run the completion and, and decide what type of completion I need to run, then I need to decide what type of pump I need to run inside this completion. How the pumps looks like, what's the size of pump, and what what's the main component of this pump. Let me just work you about what is a downhole bump sucker rod? How it's, what's the main component? How it is working and so on. Remember, the bump for each type of artificial lift, it's the heart of the system, especially for the positive displacement pumps, especially also for some type of pumps like ESP and so on. But however, the bump is the heart of the system. You need to select the right pump in order to have the highest efficiency and to produce the maximum possible production from your reservoir. What is the function of the bomb? Remember, I said before when we start this lecture, what I need from artificial lift, I need to decrease the bottom hole flow pressure and increase the discharge pressure of the bomb. It is the same function of the bomb. If the bomb is doing this function, is decreasing the bottom hole flow pressure to allow producing the desired production. Meanwhile, increasing the pressure of the well pool fluid to enable it to flow to the surface. This is the main function of the pump. How to use pump, how to configure my pump in order to achieve these two function, it is the key how to select the pump configuration, okay? Before I go in the pump, how it's working and so let me just Tell you what is the basic part of the bump. Yes, the bump is the heart of the system. But for the bump, if you look to the bump, there is almost more than 20, 25 pieces. But among of these 25 pieces, there is five main parts, like your car, you know. You have the engine, you have uh, the wheels, you have uh, some main equipment in, 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 in the car. But there is a nut, there is a piece here and there. You cannot count. For the road lift system, there is five main basic parts. Each basic part has a certain configuration and you need to select carefully in order to have the best performance of the bump. What this part and so on, you know. First, it's the bump barrel. What is mean of bump barrels? The outer diameters, the outer sides, outer parts of the bump. The bump barrel is a pressure containing chamber for the plunger. This is just to contain the pressure and the flow. The only pressure and the flow containing chamber for, for the bomb. The second bar, bar is the plunger. The plunger is moving inside the bomb, you know. All these parts, I just I separate to two, all this part while you are running in the well will be inside this bomb. It's going up and down inside this bomb. The plunger is used it's to provide fluid seal and carriers and carries a fluid seal and carries the fluids, you know the plunger sense is moving up and down, you know, and also is holding the, the traveling valve. Moving up and down is moving up against the hydrostatic head. The hydrostatic head, the flow from the bump to the surface. And below the plunger is the bump intake pressure, for delta L low pressure. 
this plunger is used to seal this hydrostatic head from this charge pressure in order not to allow the fluid just to back and create another back pressure of the body. Sorry, this is standing, uh, this is a traveling valve. And yes, this is a traveling valve. Traveling valve is ball and seat. It's a check valve, one way valve. It's open from bottom to the top, you know, and open by delta B and closed by change the direction of the fluid, you know. If I have a fluid below the bump with a certain pressure able to lift this pole up a little bit, then the fluid will be flow and pass around this wall. Then hold wall pressure during upstroke and open to allow plunger to fall during downstroke. Then upstroke, this plunge the upstroke, this traveling valve, this pole will be closed, which is moving against the float to hold all the pressure in the tubing in the upstroke. While we start to go down, when we start to go down, this traveling valve will be open, which allows the plunger to fall inside the bomb and just the flow to displace to the top of the plunger. Standing valve is the same configuration, same configuration of the traveling valve, but it's vice versa. It's open when traveling valve is closed and closed when traveling valve is open. While it's going in the upstroke, traveling valve, this will close because it's moving against the hydrostatic head. While I'm going in the downstroke, standing valve is closed because, you know, the, all the fluid is acting over the standing valve. But in the upstroke, stand, standing valve will be open because the pressure below standing valve will be higher than the pressure below the top. The last piece or part is what we call this one, this area, which is connecting either in this area or sometimes in, in the top of this area, what we call hold down assembly. <clears throat> what is a hold down assembly? I would different picture here for hold down assembly and so on. The hold down assembly is used to hold the bump in the sitting room. Remember I said the bump when we run in the tube and the bump sit in the sitting room. What is hold the bump in the inside sitting room is the hold down assembly, one of these devices. One of these one, it's when it's connecting to the bottom or the top of the bump, it's hold the bump inside the sitting nipple for the insert bump and the standing valve for the tubing bump. Meanwhile, act also as a sealing element, because you remember I said the sitting nipple with the bump or the sitting assembly of the bump, it's required to, to hold the bump in place and seal the float from the top of the bump to the bottom of the bump. What part of the bump it's doing that, it is a hold down assembly. Is there a different type of hold down assembly? Yes. There's some cup types. The ceiling will be cups like this one, plastic, rubber, Teflon type, like this, like this one, like this one, like this one, and so Or mechanicals. There is no rubber. All will be mechanical like this one, or just like this one. Mechanical, that's mean. This is steel or brass. It's metal to metal seal. Here the seal is rubber to metal. Here's metal to metal seal. Each one, each part have a certain type of application, certain type of function and so on. But sometimes I need to run the well in the tubing for a certain condition while there is no sitting nibble. No sitting nibble, then how I can stop the bump in the tubing and room? And why I need to run the bump inside the tubing if there is no sitting nibble? Sometimes if you have a hole in tubing, have a problem with the tubing, if you have a problem, with this existing, existing, existing sitting nipple, and you need to rerun the bump and so on, or just as well. What we need in, in order to not avoid just loss of production, waiting for work over, you can temporarily running the wells using a special design, special part, what we call insert bump anchor. This insert bump anchor, like a mechanical backers, it's connecting here instead of this sitting nipple to the bottom of the bump here, and you run inside the tubing at a certain, at, at any depth you need it, and at that depth with a certain type of mechanical reciprocation and rotation for this one, you can open these slips and you can open this rubber and you can hold the bump in place. How the bump is working and what is the bumping cycles and so on. 
remember, you know, for road lift system, we said in the upstroke, I have this traveling valve, this standing valve, this plunger. Going up, up, and going up is called upstroke cycle. Going down, downstroke cycle. Initially, at the beginning of the upstroke cycle, what will happen? I have ball and seat, ball and seat, check valve, check valve. This is an upstroke, that means traveling valve start to move up. When traveling valve start to move up, it's moving against flow, against hydrostatic head. Then the pressure over this pole, uh, this pole and, and of the traveling valve will be very high. This pole will be closed. Then since this pole will be closed and the plunger moving, then the plunger displaced the fluid inside the barrel to inside the tubing. But since it's closed and start to move, that means this isolated all that hydrostatic head from the top of the standing valve. But below the standing valve, it's the bump and take pressure, the bottom hole flow pressure. Then the, the pressure inside the barrel, nothing. There is no pressure because this is isolated, creating no pressure. Then delta B across this will open the standing valve. Then standing valve, while the, the bump is going up, will be always open, traveling valve will be always closed, fluid will come from below the standing valve from the formation to fill inside the bump barrels, while the fluid above the plunger is just displaced and to fill inside the tubing. Until I reach to the end of the upstroke, the barrels, this, if the, there's enough fluid, then the fluid just inside the bump will be a completely fluid inside the bump, new fluids here, and the fluid above the plunger is displaced to the inside the tubing. What happened for the down stroke? We want to start to go on the down stroke. Here, you know, it's have vice versa for the valve. I, I tell you before, when one valve is open, the second valve should be closed. Otherwise, the bump will not work. Then, while I start to go down in the down stroke, it, at the first point, when it's starting to go down, the both valve is closed. But when it starts, this is traveling valve and the road push, the plunger down is pushing against fluids here. And this fluid is pushing the traveling valve to be close, standing valve. Then start to push the fluid, the fluid usually is incompressible. Then creating a pressure higher than this hydrostatic head. Since it's creating pressure higher than this hydrostatic head, then traveling valve will be open and standing valve will be closed. Since traveling valve will be open, this, all this new fluid, it's already displaced during the upstroke, start to move to the top of the plunger. Since it's moved to the top of the plunger and the cycle start to repeat up and down. So let me see, you know, just see this animation, how it's working. This standing valve, this traveling valve. Here standing valve start to be open in the upstroke like this. This traveling valve start to open its downstroke. One of them is going, one start close, the others be open, you know. Fluid in the formation is inter, fill this one, and this all this fluid just to displace here. This is the main animation of the bump, how the downhole bump is working and so on. Okay, hope that this will be clear. Okay. We said that there is different type of oil, different type of configuration of tubing, different type of uh, uh, fluids, uh, properties, uh, different type of um, bumps and so on. What type of bump in, 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 in the oil industries you can find for the road lift bump, downhole road lift? The ABI start to divide this bump to two main categories. First, what we call tubing bump. Second category is is the insert or road bump. What's the difference between tubing bump and insert road bump? If you look here, I will, I will show you in the next slide what also in more detail what the difference. If you look the difference between this one and this one, this tubing bump, all this part of the bump is run here as a part of the tubing. For that reason, this is called tubing bump, but vice versa, all this bump, this barrel, plus the plunger assembly together is run on the road inside the tubing. For that reason, the road called road bump, because it's run on the road, or insert bump is run inside the tubing and so on. 
Okay, insert bomb. It's our hold in place by the sitting assembly hold down as I, I mentioned before. If there is a tubing, if there is, this is a tubing and this is a sitting nipple, the whole insert bump connecting to the tubing and run inside the tubing and sit inside the sitting. This can be set in this the, uh, configuration or there is some other direction. It's set, the sitting assembly here, it is a hold down assembly of the bump. There is two, two type of this is insert bump or road bump. The two type, what we mean, the bump can be set from the top or the bump can be set at the bottom. What we mean the bump can be set at the top or the bump can be set at the bottom. This is the same completion, you know, tubing, sitting nipple, tubing, sitting nipple. You have two type of bump. If the sitting assembly at the top of the bump, we call top anchor or top hold down bump. If the sitting assembly at the bottom of the bump, we call it bottom anchor or bottom assembly of the bump. The top anchor or top assembly of the bump, the whole bump run inside the tubing on the road, but the bump is sitting at the top. Then the whole bump barrels and the whole part of the bump is bathing from the sitting nipple and only the low upper part of the bump will be in the top of the sitting nipple. What the difference between this and the bottom anchor? For the bottom anchor here, the bump is sitting from its bottom and the whole part of the bump is sitting in the top of the tubing, and the top of sitting there. Why have these two different type of bump? Why the ABI and the manufacturing, manufacturing different type of bump? What this can be do and this cannot be do and the difference between. Let just, I give you a very simple example, few examples about this, you know. First of all, what if you are producing some sand from the road and there is a sand and sand tendency come from the road? What type of bump is best to use? This one or this one? If I start to produce sand from the well, usually road lift system in, in, in majority of the well and most well used for low production wells, low volume wells. That means the load velocity here is not high. And even if the float velocity is high and you stop the well and there is a sand suspended in the float, what happens if you stop the well? The sand will start to settle down. If the sand start to settle down around the bump, what will happen for this bump? This area is stagnant area. This area is not moving. The sand start to accumulate it in this area. There's no float movement. Float move from here up to the top. Sand start to settle here. If the sand start to settle here and there is a problem with the bump, when you start to uh, want to, to retrieve the bump from the well, you will be not able because the bump will stuck with this, the bump will stuck with the tubing due to this sand. But vice versa here, there is load always come of this area and come out of, 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 of the bump. And always this will be agitating area and clean this float. There is some other more function for, for both of them and so on, you know. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, uh, what happens if I have a very low pressure inside the well? Bottom hole flow pressure is very low and the discharge pressure is very high. For example, I have a discharge pressure is 4,000 4, psi and bottom hole flow pressure 100 psi. While we're going in the upstroke, what happened? And while we're going in downstroke, what happened? While we're going in downstroke, traveling valve, in order to open, it must what must compress the fluid inside the bump with the pressures higher than the hydrostatic head. Then it should be compressed the fluid inside the bump with a pressure higher than the 4,000 psi. What is the pressure outside the bump? Because it's a bump intake. The pressures outside the bump here is 100 psi. What's the delta B across the barrel? It's very high pressure. This can cause what you call ballooning effect. The barrel can be like a balloon and you can lose your production. In the worst case, the barrel can be broken due to the very high pressure and delta B and so on. In that case, I cannot use this one. But what if I have, you know, for example, I need just to, to run a bigger bump inside the tubing because in order to run insert bump inside the tubing, the bump outside the enter should be less than the uh, <coughs> uh, sitting nibble inside them. For example, 
If I want to run a bigger bump inside three and a half inch tubing as an insert bump, the maximum insert bump I can run as a topple down is two and a quarter inch bump. Meanwhile, for two for for uh, for bottom anchor bump, I can run up to two and a half inch bump. Then one of my advantage for bottom anchor bump is allow you to produce more float if it is required. If it's not, then we go with top anchor bump. I need to study my well condition, my pressures. Uh, what type of uh, environment in the well, how much pressure, gas, uh, sand, uh, solids, in order to see what type of bomb I need to have. Tubing bomb, broad bomb, top anchor, bottom, or bottom anchor, and, and so on. Tubing bomb, as I said before, you know, the main part of the tubing is run with a tubing and, and the top of the sitting level from the day one. When you run your completion, you run this with a bomb. Then you run your Setting assembly, your plunger assembly was was with or without uh, standing valve. Standing valve can be run separate, or can we run with this is uh, plunger assembly inside the tubing and so. Here is a standing valve run, and here is that this is the plunger assembly and bump assembly run in the top. Of it. There is another type of bump <laughs> in the market currently. You know, it's called oversized bump. I have tubing bump, I have insert bump, but there is also, there is oversized bump. What if I, if I need a very high production, it's more, with a capacity, with, with more with a tubing bump capacity. They run what you call oversized bump. How the oversized bump is run? Usually you connect the whole bump, you know, to the bottom of the tubing, and then you run only just the road string in the top of this uh, bump and then latch it with a plunger assembly and you run. And here you found the bump outside the diameter is bigger than the tubing inside the diameter. Usually this is used for high volume than standard tubing bump, you know, barrel is a barrel and, 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 and the, all the bump assembly is, is run as a part of the tubing, you know. It's not easy just, you know, to go below the tubing and just to have some some any wire line operation below the tubing and so on. If any problem happen inside any part of the bump, you need to completely pull out the string and so on. It's usually used for shallow wells, very high volume and so on. Uh, Mariam, you can stop me at any time. API, how the API is, no, it's just, designated the bump. Since I said in the market, there is different type of bump. There is different type of configuration of, of the bump. There is double down, bottom down, tubing bump, oversized bump, and so on. How I can differentiate the bump and size? How I can define my bump exactly from the manufacturing from and, 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 and from the factory and so on. This is a bump I need and, and, and so on. The ABI, the ABI defines a bump with a certain type of designations. They, they, they say, okay, in order to define the bump or designate the bump for a certain type of oil, for a certain type of uh, tubing, for a certain type of bump configuration, road bump or insert bump or tubing bump, it's for uh, uh, cup types or just mechanical type sitting assembly, what the length of the bump and so on, is defined with a certain type of letters and numbers. The ABI designation is a part of what we call ABI specification 11AX. ABI make a specification or written, right, written a specification for each part of oil and gas industries, you know. And for the road lift system, the ABI which controls the bump and each part of the bump specs is called ABI specs 11AX. And describe the main specification of the ABI subsurface bump. You see? The nomenclature of the ABI bump, it can be for tubing bump and for insert road bump. Usually, you are defining the bump as shown in this slide. First two number usually is, is just you need to define what type of tubing you have in the way. Whereas you can run this pump I, I have in the way or just what type of tubing I need to run this bump with this configuration. Then two things, what type of tubing I have in the well in order to run this bump with these two configuration, 
or what type of tubing I need to have in order to run. For example, I design new ones, but I design to run this type of bump, then what type of tubing, what, what size of tubing I need to run in the well in order to accumulate this bump with this size and with this configuration. The two first digit indicating about the tubing nominal size. Tubing nominal size, it just means the inside diameter of the tubing, nearly the inside diameter of the tubing. The, the other three digits is just indicating what is the plunger size or the pump size. Usually the pump size is referred to the plunger size, referred to the barrel inside them. This is in inches, you know. For an example here, this is two, three over eight of inches. That's mean the nominal tubing size of this tubing is 20, 20. If you back to this API tables, if you look here about 20, it's two, three over eight of inches. If you go back for three and a half inches, the nominal inside diameter is 30. If four and a half inches, the nominal inside diameter is 40 and so on. Then the first two digits is the nominal inside diameter of the bump. What about the bump size? The bump size, you can remove any digits, you know, just the, the point number, and the three digits is, is indicating your nominal plunger size or just the bump inside diameter or just we call, we call it the bump size. Then the bump or size here, you know, for example, for each this bump size, you need just to have this is the, the, the number across each one. For example, it's two and quarter inch bump. The number referred to two and quarter inch bump is two, two, five. And the number referred to two, seven, eight inch bump is two, seven, five inch bump. Okay, then the first bar or second bar is indicating what the bump size. For example, this bump bore size is one and a quarter inch bump size is one, two, five inch bump. Then came to the four, num four letters after that. We said that the bump by half a rod bump and tubing bump. The first letters is indicating either rod bump or tubing bump. Here, if you look here, the first one, it's rod. R, T is tubing. After that, you can go with the other number, with the other, uh, sorry, uh, with the other letter, second letter. The other second letters is just indicate, uh, just inform you what is the barrel. If you remember, the barrel of the bomb is a container for the fluid and the pressure. The thickness of these barrels, it's high thickness or low thickness. It's the thickness of the barrel. If it is high, what you call the heavy walls, it's take the letter H. If it is thin, it's called thin wall, it's take the letter W and so on. After that, this bump, you know, remember we, we said that there is a cup types or mechanical types bump. If it's a cup types bump or just, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, before cup and, and mechanical, is the bump is topple down or bottom down, top anchor or bottom anchor. If the bump is bottom anchor, you are added letter P. If it's top anchor, you are added letter T like this. It's top anchor or bottom anchor. There's a special type of bump, what we call. It's not top anchor, not bottom anchor. The bump, it's reversed. Usually for the standard bump, the plunger is moving up and down. And for special type of bump, you know, there is a, 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 the plunger is not moving and what's moving is a barrel. If you found letter T, like this uh, instead of, of A or B, it means the barrel is moving up and down. It's called traveling barrel bump and so on. Letter C at the end is cup type or mechanical type. And then what is the length of this barrel in feet? Barrel length in feet and so on. I'll show you some example. And also the length of the plunger, the length of the top extension and the length of the bottom extension. Let me just show you some example in this figure. Just this, I have a bump, 25, 150 RHPC 12532. What does that mean in the graph like this and so on? This means, first of all, 278, that's inside diameter of this tubing nominal diameter is 278. The inside diameter is about 2.44 is 25. And the nominal diameter of this tubing 
it's 25 and the tubing size is 278. And the outside diameters of the plunger or inside the diameter of the barrel is 1.5, 150. That means a pump or plunger diameter is 1.5 and so on. This is bump, it's insert bump. Oh, the whole bump run inside the tubing. And that means this bump R is insert bump. H, if you remember H at U, it's a, sorry, H it's a bump barrels. It's thickness of the bump barrel. This is bump barrel. What this thickness is heavy wall or thin wall. This is two difference between heavy wall and thin wall barrel. If you look to this one, it's thin, it's heavy wall barrel. That's mean the thickness is high. If you look to this thin wall barrel, that's mean the thickness is, is low. If the thickness is high, will be heavy wall. This one, it's heavy wall. If the thickness is low, W, that's mean a thin wall. This bump is bottom anchor. If you look, the bump is bottom. It's all the bump in the top of the sitting limb. This bump is cup type. If you look here, it's cup type. It's not a mechanical. It's a cup type bump and so on. 12, it's the length of the barrel. Length of these barrels is 12 feet. And five is the length of the plunger. This plunger length is five feet. Three, what this extension, sometimes use extension for heavy wall barrels, you know. You will find extension with a heavy wall barrel. What the, the length of this extension is three feet. Top usually, first one is the top extension and second one, it's the bottom extension. This is just an example to show you what's mean of this ABI designation for the downward. If I go down a little bit more, it's road string. What this is the last part then I was talking. What is a sucker rod string? And why I need a sucker rod string? Sucker rod string it is a mechanical link between the pumping units and the downhole bumps. It's just this is what we call the rod string, <coughs> starting from here, from bullet rod up to the bump, connecting the what's connecting the bumping unit to the bump, it is the called sucker rod string. And the sucker rod string used <coughs> to transfer the reciprocating motion from service unit to activate and to power the downhole pump. What I need to consider is when we design this rod string, I need to consider many factors. You know, I need just when we design the system, I will, I will go with you in, in some details about all these factors when we design. But however, you need to know that the road string, it is a mechanical link, link connecting the bump to the surface. It's come usually in standard, there's different configuration, different type, but in standard, come in jointed like this, jointed connecting with the coupling like this and connecting to each one until reach from bottom to the surface. There is a type of road strings. Yes, there is a type of second road, a type of road string, and so on. The type of road string we can have a jointed second road, like the one I show you before. This is jointed second road. The jointed second road is there's a type of jointed second road. Yes, there's a conventional ABI steel like this steel second road, conventional ABI steel second road. This is what we call the hollow second road. Second road. This is solid second road, huh? The sucker rod is like a pipe, a very small pipe. And there's a fiberglass sucker rod. Okay? Type. This is just as a type. And there is a continuous sucker rod, continuous sucker rod like this. It's instead to have a jointed sucker rod like this, joint connecting to the joint, to the joint. No, there is a continuous sucker rod connect from the bottom to the, to the top. Type. So what's the main component? What's the main parts of the rod string? Remember, I said the rod string, it came from the surface, from the surface of the bump here, from here up to here. Then the main component of this one, either you can have jointed rods, either these, that, or that, or continuous sucker rods, and jointed rods should be connecting to each other with a coupling, and plus what we call bony rod, small sucker rod, small shortened lens, in order to complete the whole depth and so on. General road dimension as a second road, as <coughs> a standard, where is more, almost more than 80% of the world using 
the joint is standard sucker rod, usually it's coming either in 25 or, or 30 feet in length. The length from here up to the, <coughs> the coupling here is 25 or 30 feet in length. It's came, it's male by male threads, you know, and you have coupling is female by female to connect to each other. You know. The emptor of sucker rod, the outside emptors of this sucker rod, it's starting from five over eight of inches up to one and a half inches with an incremental of one over eight of inches. Then you found different between size and size, one over eight of inches. Then for example, this three quarter, seven, eight, one inches, one over eight inches, an inch. This is an incremental of the standard ABI sucker rod. Plus the pony rod, it's not a continuous, it's, it's not a standard rod with this lens is a same rod, but with a very short lens, with either two feet, four feet, six, and 10 feet. These are the road general configuration, general di dimensions and so on. Since the road is steel and different metallurgy and the road lifting fluid and lifting loads, fluid loads and lifting itself, then the road come in different grades. Each grade have a different capability, different tensile strength and, and, and so on, you know. ABI is just clarify, just defines the world to different grade. Grade C or grade K or grade D. Grade D, there is different subgrade of grade D and so on. Plus there is none ABI high tensile strength. Because according to the ABI grade K or C or D, the limit of the road to lift loads. Loads, usually load of load plus the load of the load. Then the manufacturing in order to run deeper and produce more fluids, they start to produce a special type of road with a high tensile strength but it's not an API. Each manufacturing have different physical and chemical properties for us in, in road. <clears throat> Even for the coupling, there is different type of coupling. Depend on uh, when I need to use a coupling, what type of well, what type of completion, what type of fluids and so on, you know, what the size of the tubing and so on. Usually there is what we call spray meter from outside to increase the hardness of the coupling or just ABI coupling and so on. Even the coupling size came in two dimensions. Remember, the road and coupling run inside the tubing. If you are, imagine this is a red color one, is a tubing, and they run size inside the tubing, standard road size. The standard road size of the tubing usually is taking a lot of space inside the tubing, especially if the bigger size of the tubing. I will give you an example, you know. If I run, for example, with one inch road inside two seven eight inch tubing. The coupling of one inch road standard outside inch coupling is almost just a rough figure. I give you a rough figure, you know, two plus one over 16 of, or three over 16 of inches. And what's inside the enter of the two seven eight inch tubing is 2.44, then, sorry. Then the clearance here will be a very low clearance. There is a tendency or just potentials of coupling to be weird to contact the tubing. And also the, for the fluid to flow to bath from this one, it will be a very high pressure loss in this area. For the trees of the manufacturing, he said there is an alternative for that, what you call slim hole coupling with a smaller diameter and the same tensile strength as you know, but little bit could be expensive and have some less physical powers. This is just an example for the slim hole coupling and all size coupling and so on. What else in the market if I need to run more in the world for the road and road types and so on? There is what we call fiberglass sucker road. The fiberglass sucker road is a special sucker road. It's the same like the other roads, but with a special uh, physical and chemical properties, you know. Usually we use fiberglass second road if I have two main problems in the world, or just one of them or two together. If I need to run for very deep walls and I very, have a very high load of the road string in order to reduce the weight of the road string, then I need just to run with a what we call fiberglass road string. Roads are lighter in weight than compared to the other, you know. Elasticity, you know, Due to its, its, its own elasticity, the design of the road string, sometimes, you know, 
if I run a very high speed stroke per minute, can increase my bottom hole stroke with what we call over travel or under travel and so on. And also for corrosion, you know, the fiberglass is can withstand very high, can withstand for corrosion, it's compared to the uh, steel saccharode, you know, and, and so on. You know. But really you have a lot of disadvantage, you know, like the cost, you know, like the stretch, you know, if, if the road is running under a very high load, you can have a very high stretch with a slow speed, I can lose a lot of my downhole stroke, you know, this road I cannot run in compressions and so on, you know, if the road is broken, it's not an easy to fish this road and, and so on, you know, the fishing is very hard and so on. The other type of road, what we call the hollow sucker road, it can use for a special application if I need to inject some fluids inside the well. For a special type of application, the sucker road is what we call the hollow sucker road. The continuous road or continuous sucker roads, uh, I don't know, uh, Mariam, I need to stop here because the time is... Uh, yes, if we can't finish. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, you know, because I still, still have a lot of things to do, because <laughs> now almost uh, near to two hours. Eh? Okay, so so we'll finish or you will proceed? Yes, uh, it's better to finish because I see, you know, more than that the people maybe is not able to, <laughs> to catch me. Eh? Oh, okay, okay. So thank you, doctor, for the time you dedicated to deliver this informative session today. So let us begin by addressing the questions. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, what is the difference between the landing nipple and the seating nipple? Are they, yes, are they a, the same? No. Landing nipple is a wireline nipple, wireline configurations, you know, used just to run the plug and to run the wireline operations. Uh, and the seating nipple, the special seating nipple for road lift system pump. And there's two types of that depend on the type of the bump and hold down assembly. If it's a mechanical or if it is a, a cup types. And even if it's a mechanical sitting nibble, there's a type what we call top anchor or bottom anchor. This is what we call the uh, <coughs> sitting nibble. However, sometimes with a special type configuration, I can use the landing nibble to, uh, as a sitting nibble. But in this case, I need to have a, a special fabrication for the bump sitting assembly or down assembly. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is that, under what circumstances were produced uh, through the casing? No, uh, I can, usually it's not preferred to produce through the casing, but some in some cases for shallow wells and uh, you know, special application, you can produce from the casing. Some other people, you know, that's, uh, uh, use in case you have dead volume, dead liquids, and a non-corrosive environments, you know, you can use, but it's not preferred to use through the, to produce through the case again. Okay, thank you. And finally, what is the difference between pumping efficiency and system efficiency? Yes, there is a big difference between pumping efficiency uh, and system efficiency. When you start to say pumping efficiency, there is two bump here. Huh? The downhole bumps and the bumping units. Each bump has different efficiency. The bump efficiency, it's how the bump is working and react. And there is two types of the bump efficiency, either mechanical efficiency or volumetric efficiency. Mechanical efficiency, if some part of the bump is not performed as per design, then I start to have some leak, some float not working, the valve is not working and so on. This is a bump is lost part of its efficiency. Volumetric efficiency, that's mean, I, 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 I run the bump to produce a certain volume, but there is a gas, you know, inside the bump and you occupy it uh, a very high volume or a certain volume of the bump. Then for example, I designed this bump to produce 1000 barrel per day, but the volume of the gas, it's about, for example, 250 barrels then the bump only lifting or just working to lift 750 barrel liquids in the pneumatic efficiency here, 75%. But the total system efficiency, that's mean, it's a power. I consider here about the power and loss. Total system efficiency mean 
When I start to run the bump, this bump run as a displacement down hole displacement. This bump is just run and displace down hole, for example, a certain volume of flow rates, certain volume of liquids, 100 barrel per day. How much pressure the bump is creating to lift this 100 barrel per day to the surface? It's, for example, a certain pressure. Then I calculate how much the hydraulic horsepower. This is a useful hydraulic horsepower. For example, it's 10 horsepower. Then in order to produce my fluids, I use the horsepower. It's just the bump required just to lift. It's 100 horsepower. But at the end side, in order to operate the system, I need the motors. I measured the horsepower at the motor, at the current and volt. I found the motors. It's used, for example, it's uh, 20 horsepower. Then the total system efficiency is 10 over 20. Whereas I lost, this is 10 horsepower. The motor, in order to run it themselves, it's required some horsepower. It's in, it loses inside the motor. Like when you start your car, you know, if you run your car and without moving, the car consumed some gasoline. When you start to move the car, the car consumed more gasoline. And, and the, the motor, it's also rotate the bumping unit. And the bumping unit, in order to rotate and go up and down, it's consumed some power. There is a losses inside the bumping unit. The road itself, there is a losses uh, across the road with the friction of the load and the tubing and so on. Then the total losses from the input power the, uh, of the motor up to the output power from the bump is what we call total system efficiency. It's clear or? Yes, yes, clear. So thank you again, doctor, for joining us today. Uh, so this session has been recorded and it will be uploaded soon on Pyopatra's YouTube channel. Uh, so you can kindly subscribe if you want to get our latest updates. Uh, webinars for this course will be held every Thursday and Tuesday, uh, 5 p.m. Egypt time. Uh, some key reminders before closing up. Uh, first, please do not forget to join uh, the Google Classroom for the Artificial Lift Technology course. Uh, the codes of the classrooms are posted on the Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook page. And I think two codes are posted for this course. However, you're only required to join one course. Uh, second, once you join, kindly fin uh, fill the personal information document. Uh, fill the name, your name and family name uh, since uh, clearly since this name will be the one which will be automatically put on your certificate. So please fill it correct, correctly. And third, uh, please solve the required uh, quizzes. There are about eight quizzes and do the final exam which will be held at the end of this course and the date will be posted on the Facebook page. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to get your certificate and the passing grade is uh, 75%. Uh, that's all for today. Now have a nice day and see you in future webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Mom.